Good evening. First of all, I'd like to thank the organisers of this symposium for inviting me to give this talk. It's an honour to be here and I'm greatly looking forward to hearing the papers, attending workshops, taking part in the discussions during the rest of this symposium. The title of my talk is The Long Revolution and Music Education, and Popular Music Education, I should say. Or can popular music education change society? This is, I realise, an enormous and ambitious title. But tonight I should like to consider some of the issues presented by the learning and teaching of popular music from a macro or high-level sociological perspective. This is not to say that I believe popular music education is only useful in an instrumental sense to facilitate societal change. I believe passionately in the right of all young people to participate in music education that allows them to study contemporary popular music, if they so wish, for its own sake and its own intrinsic rewards. But I am interested also in looking at how this part of the sociological picture might influence the bigger one. As you know, sociology involves the science of society, social institutions and social relationships, specifically the systematic study of the development, structure, interaction and collective behaviour of organised groups of human beings. As a sociologist of music education then, my work involves the study of music education in relation to society, its institutions and social relationships. And I have a particular research interest in the study of popular music in these respects. The intended purpose of my talk is to frame this paper as a response to one of the big questions that has been asked by sociologists of education for a long time. Indeed, the question asked by the renowned critical pedagogue Michael Apple in the title of his 2013 book, can education change society? And I wish to bring the question specifically into alignment with the purpose of our gathering here by asking, can popular music education change society? As Apple in a subsequent paper in 2015 points out, if we conceptualise this question in terms only of society's economic relations, or as completely reliant upon ref re sorry, reflecting these relations, too many R's, as many scholars do, for example in a whole volume of the Journal of Educational Theory published in 2015, then the only change that can be valued or indeed looked for will involve change in the economy and in class relations. Viewed in this way, the answer to his question, as agreed by these many scholars and others, appears to be very emphatically, no. <laughs> So this is going to be a very short talk, <laughs> thank you, and good night. <laughs> or, however, <laughs> let's just consider this question for a little longer. What about if we ask, as Apple does, whether it could be that restricting our thinking to whether or not education can interrupt economic inequities and result in class positions is not rather one-dimensional? in the interconnected and complex world of contemporary human societies and relationships. Apple suggests that such a reading fails to recognise the many complex interrelations of power at work in society and the ways in which they affect each other. Moreover, he suggests that it prevents activists from forming important alliances or decentered unities, as he calls them, that he says are absolutely essential to progress towards social justice. He suggests that a more fruitful way to approach this question might be to ask, can schools play a role in making a more just society possible? If not, why not? If so, what can they do? This is obviously still ambitious and covers an enormous scope encompassing many types of educational inequity and social injustice in each area of which there is a growing body of specialist literature to which I cannot possibly do justice tonight. But I'd like to ask you to bear with me in pursuing this as an interesting macro level question. Perhaps a good 500 foot high perspective from which to begin a symposium such as this.
and one that Apple thinks we can approach with some hope of providing answers. For the purpose of the symposium for which we are gathered, gathered therefore, I'd like to ask, can popular music education in schools play a role in making a more just society possible? If not, why not? If so, what can it do? I'm equally aware that the field of what I'm calling popular music is at least as vast, if not more vast, than that of social justice, as this mapping project is showing. I don't know if everybody knows this, everynoise.com. It's mapping all the popular music in the world. This is just one tiny area of the map. And when you click on each of these words, you can hear a sound sample of the type of music. So it's a really cool way to lose a weekend, at least. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm aware that describing all these musics under the one term popular music is again a vast oversimplification and I'm hoping again that you'll bear with me and my oversimplification for the purposes of being able to examine this very big picture issue from a macro perspective. What is Apple thinking of when he asks whether schools can contribute to a more just society then? One of the things is a vision of, quote, an education that responds to all of us, one that embodies a vision of the common good, that says it needs constant criticism and revision to keep it alive, end quote. I suppose the first thing I should clarify is why I think social change is necessary. There's no doubt I believe that we live in an era of encroaching global capitalism and increasingly universal neoliberal governmental policies that give rise to many problems, including economic inequality. As Thomas Piketty has shown in his influential book, Capital in the 21st Century, there is a very simple reason for this, which I'll let him explain in his own words. Okay, so it's, it's very nice to be here tonight. So I've been working on the history of uh, income and wealth uh, distribution for the past 15 years. And one of the interesting uh, lessons uh, coming from this uh, historical evidence is indeed that in the long run, uh, there is a tendency for the rate of return of capital to exceed uh, the economy's growth rate. And this tends to lead to high concentration of wealth, not infinite concentration of wealth, but the higher the gap between R and G and the higher the level of inequality of wealth towards uh, society uh, tends to converge. So it's worth listening to that just to hear the French accent, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, what Piketty is saying is that we are in a self-feeding loop of wealth inequality. The situation is exacerbated by government policies involving the demolition of social programs for the poor, causing rising hunger and homelessness, affecting an ever younger population. That's from my own local paper, my own small town, that shows the falling age and rising number of young people in homeless shelters, growing pension and healthcare insecurity, and the recurrence of xenophobia, homophobia, racism and violence towards ethnic minorities in many countries, as unfortunately the events of this past weekend have shown. For education, the effects of global neoliberalism have also not contributed to an educational system that encourages what the Europeans call Bildung, a German word meaning education that nurtures autonomy and individuality and focuses on continuous personal development. The educational trend towards performativity in relation to competitive global educational standards and high stakes testing has resulted in what British sociologist Basil, Basil Bernstein described as the vocationalization of education or education as training for work and life. It has been accompanied by a focus on trainability of subjects or preparing young people to be trainable and retrainable docile bodies, as Foucault would say prepared to meet the ever-changing needs of the global economic machine. I don't know if you can read the top of the picture, but it says they found that if they added just a pinch of salt, schools produced 10,000 more engineers. <laughs> 
in this conception of education, as we know, the arts, including music, have become increasingly marginalised, both at the compulsory schooling and the higher education levels, in favour of concentration in curriculum and research funding on the somewhat repellently titled STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering and mathematics deemed by governments to be most important to national competitiveness in the changing labour economy. Alongside this has been the return of some previously progressive music curricula to more traditional forms in line with the neoconservative ideology of preserving tradition and reconfirming elite culture. I'm thinking particularly about my old homeland, the UK, at that point. It's not surprising, therefore, <coughs> that some music educators, particularly those advocating for the role of popular music in education with a keen eye to social justice, might feel somewhat defeated by the apparent inability of popular music education to disrupt various patterns of exclusion and inequity. <coughs> However, in considering the potential of popular music education to effect change towards a more just society, we may perhaps have overlooked the power and influence of culture as an agent of social change. Our hopes of successfully countering the effects of educational policies in producing an ever more unjust society may rest, as Apple suggests, precisely on, on acknowledging the socially transformative power of culture. And tonight I wish to begin by conceptualising this in terms of the particular power of popular culture to effect individual growth and change in music education. I join with Apple in believing that alongside activism in the economy and politics, this can contribute to what Raymond Williams termed the long revolution. In his seminal work in the field of cultural studies, the long revolution, Williams envisaged history since the industrial era as a series of revolutions, political, industrial, <coughs> and cultural. These interlinked revolutions, he believed, engender gradually increasing popular control over society, hence the title, The Long Revolution. The Long Revolution is, therefore, an ongoing popular quest for freedom advanced through interlinked social movements within which, importantly, the power of culture is acknowledged alongside politics and economics. It's here, I believe, that popular music education might have an important role to play in the journey towards a more just society. Williams, who's credited as one of the founders of the sociology of culture, described his overview of society as follows. It seems to me that we are living through a long revolution which our best descriptions only in part interpret. It is a genuine revolution, transforming men, I added, and women, and institutions, continually extended and deepened by the action of millions, continually and variously opposed by explicit reaction and by the pressure of habitual forms and ideas. Gramsci explained the mechanism by which some of the less overt opposition takes place as hegemony or hegemony, <coughs> depends which of those two pronunciations you favour, the control of one social group by another, or in the case of cultural hegemony, the imposition on society as a whole of the values and culture of the most powerful social group as a means of control. This involves a process whereby the views of the powerful become so ingrained that they are perceived and accepted as common sense. Although at a very early stage when Williams first observed these movements, he suggested that we could not possibly understand social development if we conceived of these three revolutions separately. For Williams, the profound cultural revolution occurring in the 60s formed a great part of the contemporary human experience of life. Williams saw even the industrial and democratic revolutions of the time as examples of humanity's creative power humanity changing the world and insisting we all took power to direct our own lives. Considering that this work was written long before events such as the Arab Spring and other recent popular interventions in the affairs of their countries, Williams' prescience is perhaps quite remarkable. Of course, the key question asked by Williams in the 60s and still asked by scholars today is whether the new opportunities thus created are used for human growth or as a means of perpetuating existing systems of social organisation with their attendant inequities. 
or indeed of generating new oppressive forms of social organisation. Sadly, the aftermath of some recent political interventions have demonstrated the ability of new forms of inequity to arise from moments of potential freedom. And I'd like to come back to this point a little later when I'm talking about the work of Richard Day. I see very clear connections between William's rather abstract theorisation of the role of culture in society and the more concrete theoretical work of the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu and his theory of practice. Bourdieu's theory was developed to help him understand and explain the ways in which social practice, or basically our behaviour, worked. He observed from his fieldwork in rural France and in Algiers that social interactions were not merely governed by the rules of a particular society, but appeared to be more like the moves in a game of strategy, with each player trying to make advances within social arenas he called fields. Bourdieu's theory re relies on three key concepts. First, the concept of capital. Second, that of habitus. And third, that of field. To begin with habitus, it is a way of being. The habitual state, especially of the body, and in particular, a predisposition, tendency, propensity or inclination. It's structured by one's past social experiences, particularly those within the family and education. It's also structuring in that it tends to shape individual present and future actions by establishing perceptions, appreciations and practices that shape patterns of behaviour consistent with previous experiences and future projections. So in other words, habitus is what makes us behave the way we behave. Habitus doesn't act alone, however. Human action or practice is for Bourdieu the result of complicated interactions between one's habitus and the field. Bourdieu used the concept of field to describe the social arena within which actions took place. There have been various analogies produced to describe the field concept, and a very useful one is that of a football field. Bourdieu frequently re related social life to a game and compared it to football, a game he liked to play. Like Bourdieu's fields, the football field has boundaries within which the game is to be played. Players take given positions on the field and operate within delineated spaces. New players have to learn the rules of the game. Over time, these rules become implicit. In other words, every time we go to a football game, the referee doesn't stand in the middle of the field and say, now this is what's going to happen, rule one they're taken for granted or they become assumed. And Bourdieu said the same thing happens in social life. He also claimed that the game was competitive. He suggested that agents manipulated strategies to attempt to improve their position within the field. The object of the game was to accumulate various types of capital. And he identified four types, economic, cultural, social, and symbolic and symbolic capital stands for all the other types, for example, in the form of qualifications. He summarised the relationship between his three concepts neatly, they say, as follows. Habitus times capital plus field equals practice. Well, to put this into words, our social practice or everyday life is produced by the relationship between our individual dispositions our position in a field and the amount of capital that we hold within that field. Now, you'll be thinking, when on earth is she going to talk about music? Well, now, let's see how these concepts might work to help answer my question. Can popular music, education in schools, play a role in making a more just society? If not, why not? If so, what can it do? I would argue that one of the things popular music education might do to further a more just society would happen at the, ha at the level of the individual habitus. When popular music is used as curriculum content in which learning and teaching embrace pedagogies and technologies authentic to the music's being studied, permitting student autonomy and ownership of the learning and teaching process, I suggest positive changes to habitus may occur. My colleagues 
Carol Bynan, Betty Ann Yonker, Leslie Linton and Jennifer Lang and I conducted a study over two academic years with two groups of Canadian elementary and secondary school students using the informal learning model that came to attention through Lucy Green's work in the UK Musical Futures Project. While this is not by any means the only pedagogical model that may, may be used to work with popular music in authentic pedagogical ways, it's one with which I'd had some previous experience and I was interested to try it in Canada. In case there are those here who haven't heard of informal learning, I think this video best demonstrates the process. So basically informal learning happens by students choosing the music they want to learn, first of all, and in most cases, as it was in our two schools, it was always popular music. And they learn it by listening to recordings or watching videos in our case, and copying what they hear and then teaching each other with help from their teacher. The teacher doesn't disappear, but the teacher's in a different role as a co-learner and coach. We found that our students did something. What did they do? They developed during the project <laughs> an increased sense of their own musical capabilities that confounded many of their previous expectations of what they would be able to achieve when presented with real pop music instruments. They also developed a different relationship with their teacher, who adopted the role of a coach and co-learner. And they gained increasing confidence in themselves as both learner and teacher. I don't have time to share detailed analysis with you here, but the, the publications that I've done this in are listed in my references at the end if you'd like to see more of the data. I've suggested when discussing data from this project that within the musical learning situation, two distinct forms of cultural capital might be identified, which I've called pedagogical and musical capital. Well, I'm not the first to use these terms, I believe I'm defining them quite differently to other authors. Pedagogical capital was first referred to by Livingston in 2007 as a quality that some students possess that enables them to arrive at the academic table better positioned to take advantage of our educational offerings. Hayes 2011 subsequently envisions this as an attribute of teachers' practices. I interpret it in a slightly different way that conveys more agency on the part of the students as comprising skills, knowledge and understanding related to learning and teaching. Moreover, it concerns ownership of pedagogical decision making. I feel this is more in keeping with the new sociology of childhood, for example Coursero 2011, where children are seen as active agents in the interpretation and reproduction of their own culture and ultimately their own childhoods. Coulson in 2010 defines musical capital as, quote, a useful shorthand for the interconnected cultural, social and symbolic assets that musicians acquire and turn to economic advantage in the music field, end quote. My own definition is more affective than economic and concerns skills in and knowledge and understanding of music 
affecting self-perceptions of musicality and musical potential. <coughs> Bourdieu was able to plot positions within the dominant field of power against the axes of economic and cultural capital. I have suggested that useful determinants of social position in music education might be rel relative possession of musical and pedagogical capital. So these are my two, oh, those, the, the musical capital from low to high, Ooh. and the pedagogical capital from low to high. And this is the trajectory of the students throughout our project, and the data was pretty much uniform in that respect. And this, I suggest, was the teacher trajectory in terms of ownership of both musical and pedagogical capital. Many of the students involved in this informal learning project with popular music appear to have made significant gains in their accumulation of these capitals. This altered their habituses and in turn advanced their positions within the field of power. By facilitating change at an individual level in terms of accrual of other types of capital besides economic capital, it situated agents differently in the field of power and allowed both teachers and students to develop dispositions or ways of being in the world that may over time change the nature of things such as elite knowledge in music and engender in our subject new forms of common sense. Each individual student with whom we work in music education is an entity that becomes part of one of the organised groups of humans that make up society. It is the interaction of these individuals' habituses, alongside their holdings of capital and field position, that creates society. Work, therefore, that allows positive growth and change in the habitus and an alteration of field position must result in social change on some level, I would argue. It's an example of a small step forward in the long revolution, one attributable to the domain of culture rather than politics or economics. This might be said to be an example of counter-hegemony. Gramsci in 1971 argued that one of the tasks of a truly counter-hegemonic education was not to throw out elite knowledge, but to reconstruct its form and content so that it served genuinely progressive social needs. In the past, I've written about how we might do this through popular music education. Canadian sociologist, political scientist and activist Richard Day has suggested, however, that counter-hegemony may not be the most pro productive way to redress social injustices, and has proposed that we learn lessons from some of the new social movements in approaching social change from what he terms the logic of affinity rather than that of hegemony. The last section of this paper, then, examines popular music education from this perspective. It's a challenging perspective, but it's one that I think presents some ideas that might be useful and interesting to think with. Day has noted that a number of contemporary social movements have departed from the universalizing conception of social change that is characteristic of the logic of hegemony, as it has developed within post-Marxism and neoliberalism. Replacing the logic of hegemony is a logic of affinity drawn from anarchist movements. This is accompanied, according to Day, by a focus on peaceful direct action. Such movements resist what he terms the hegemony of hegemony. He defines this as the commonsensical assumption that meaningful social change and social order itself can only be achieved through the deployment of universalizing hierarchical forms. In other words, the belief that macro structures are essential to social order and that only macro change can affect social change. It's here perhaps that I feel we have to be careful when we, when we attempt to develop forms of popular music education intended to result in a more just society. There is, advises Day, the possibility that in attempting to counter hegemony by working for macro level social change, radical new forms of activism, or in our case of popular music education, may become engulfed 
by dominant societal forces and assimilated into the Borg, if you're a Star Trek watcher, <laughs> and turned into new universal hierarchical forms, lacking the reformative power of their original initiative. This is it. Pardon me. <coughs> This is indeed how neoliberalism works, engulfing and assimilating the radical and transforming it to its own ends. Day continues to show, however, that creating new universal hierarchical forms may not only be unnecessary to achieving social change, but also that some very important examples of 21st century social activism, for example in alternative media and anti-globalisation, challenge this premise following on from a long tradition of affini affinity-based direct action that he claims has been submerged under neoliberal and post-Marxist theory and practice. He therefore discusses the potential of non-hegemonic forms of radical social change, which he claims as a provisional definition of the logic of affinity. It is that which always already undermines hegemony. And now we come back to culture. Referring to Williams, among other authors, he acknowledges those cultural scholars who have considered the possibilities of what he terms different logics of struggle. He acknowledges Williams and Hall, who, like Bourdieu, were insistent that culture involves struggle, not only over meaning and identity, but also over political and economic power. He analyzes the successes of some of the newest social movements to a shift from a counter-hegemonic politics of demand to a non-hegemonic politics of the act. And it's here, I think, that we may need to pay particular attention if we really intend popular music education to help us advance the long revolution. Day describes as fantasy what he calls a previous politics of demand, one I believe we may have engaged in in music education, myself included. As Day opines, clearly the fundamental fantasy of the politics of demand is that the cur currently hegemonic formation will recognise the validity of the claim presented to it and respond in a way that produces an event of emancipation. Most of the time, however, it does not. Instead, it defers, dissuades, or provides a partial solution to one problem that exacerbates several others. In other words, one expects by representing social injustice presented by, for example, hegemonic exclusive forms of music education to the dominant institution, that they will realise the injustice being brought to their attention, accept the validity of the claim, and then respond in a manner that ensures a more just situation. In fact, however, Day says this rarely happens. He suggests that an approach more likely to achieve the desired ends is actually to cross the fantasy, as he calls it, to an approach that does not reproduce the conditions of its own emergence. This involves abandoning the anticipation of a non-dominating response from structures of domination. It involves surprise, both to oneself and to the structure, by inventing a response that precludes the necessity of the demand and thereby breaks out of the loop of the endless perpetuation of desire for emancipation. This involves an abandonment of attempts to change state power by advocating or activising for macro-level changes, and instead gives increased recognition to the fact that the state, or any other dominant powerful form, is itself comprised of interpersonal relationships, and that it is at this level that fruitful change may take place. And then he provides examples of 21st century social movements, such as the anti-globalisation movement, that recognise the dangers of the logic of hegemony and respond to them by taking active measures at their deepest organisational and operational levels, not to create a new power around a hegemonic centre, but to challenge, disrupt and disorient the processes of global hegemony, to refuse rather than re-articulate those forces, that are tending towards the universalisation of the liberal capitalist ecumen. They do so according to Day, 
not by pursuing a sudden and complete departure from dominant structures, but by embracing the strategy of structural renewal proposed by Landauer, among others, which embraces a willingness to coexist alongside one's enemies, while one puts in place alternatives, which will render them redundant. In this way, Day suggests, it does not provide positive energy to existing structures and processes in the hope of their amelioration. Rather, it aims to reduce their eff efficacy and reach by rendering them redundant. How would such movements look within popular music education? How might the long revolution, the ongoing popular quest for freedom, be played out in 21st century popular music education contexts using the logic of affinity rather than that of hegemony? What might these new forms of popular music education look like? I'm hoping to find some ideas during this conference, <laughs> but some initial guiding thoughts inspired by Day, and we're nearly at the end, hang in there. I know it's really late and you're all really tired, but I'm nearly done, are that they will deliberately refute the logic of hegemony by protecting themselves from developing universalizing power centers that position themselves above the groups that constitute them. They will recognize that because social structures are ways of coexisting as humans, changing such macro structures is in large part a matter of changing micro relations, and that culture and its effects on habitus play key roles in this. They will acknowledge that new forms become reality only in the act of being realized. The act of changing reality, of providing ourselves and our communities with new realities alongside other forms of the self and other communities, is therefore, as Day says, intersubjective and deeply ethical. They will embrace the logic of affinity that arises out of a rejection of hegemony in its dual form. They will reject the view that society is organized by domination over others or persuasion of others through ideological means, and instead will proceed from a wish to produce alternatives to power-based power forms of music education that work alongside current institutions. They will advance through disengagement and reconstruction rather than by reform or revolution, the goal being not to produce a new knowable totality, but to enable experiments and the rise of new ways of being, both musically, pedagogically, and socially. And finally, they will investigate the relationships between these newly constituted subjects in the hope of creating new types of musical community. Perhaps such modes of popular music education will produce for us what Day terms the new uncommon sense. As he observes of the new independent media centres, this is precisely what is being done through the use of tactics that not only prefigure non-hegemonic alternatives to state and corporate forms, but also create them here and now. Are there now, or might there in the future be, popular music education equivalents, I wonder? If so, what are they, or what might they be? So to conclude, I began this paper by reframing Michael Apple's question, can education change society, as can popular music education play a role in making a more just society possible? If not, why not? If so, what can it do? I hope that through this paper I have explored some of the issues these questions present from a sociology of music education perspective. I've discussed the challenges posed by viewing education's potential for social change only from a macroeconomic perspective. And the opportunities presented as identified by Apple in adopting William's view of social change as a long revolution in which politics, economics and culture play equally important roles. I've briefly presented some thoughts on how a micro perspective utilizing Bourdieu's theory of practice and in particular the formation and change of habitus through popular music education might play a positive role in such revolution. And finally, I've suggested that we approach these issues from the perspective Day provides within which the hegemony of hegemony is challenged by approaching social change from a logic of affinity drawn from the anarchist tradition of social movements. 
This would involve developing and adopting multiple approaches to popular music education that take into account the precepts upon which contemporary social movements have achieved success. Such approaches would always already undermine hegemony. At the least, I hope that I provided a provocation for discussion with which to begin this symposium and a consideration of how the long revolution might advance through popular music education, not via counter hegemony, but via affinity. I'll let Michael Apple have the last word. Changing the world, rewriting it would require a combination of economic, political and cultural work. The task is to continue the work in each sphere. I'm going to continue. Thank you for listening. And for staying awake. <laughs> we have time for questions. If anyone, would... yes. Thank you, Ruth. Um, you just reminded me of the publication in 2007, I think, by Arjun Apadure called "Fear of Numbers," mm -hmm. where he talked about cellular structure and vertebrate structure. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that the concept of hegemony here uh, draws on the notion of the long revolution, and by would slash R against the evolution, it would take us all the way back to Darwin's origin of species. Um, I'm thinking of a more respectable organism, much feared in the world I live in, called the mosquito, <laughs> whose job it is not to embrace hegemony of any form, but to continue its own life cycle. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if some of those lessons from the respected mosquito might actually be useful ways forward in popular music education? Well, I think that's a really interesting point and a really good analogy. Actually, I, I gave a speech um, in Brazil at their Association of Music Educators Conference and one of the slides there that I had said, if you think you're too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a gnat in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I think this, this micro, micro idea and this always, already offering things that undermine hegemony might be a very fruitful way to consider change. Are there any other questions? I have a question. Thank you, Ruth. That was great. Really, lots and so well organized and kind of logically unfolding, so thank you. Um, I wonder how Bourdieu and the issue of accumulation, right? So all this capital, there, there, to a certain extent, there's accumulation throughout, right? Uh, and you know, obviously, accumulation has a relationship to traditional ways of learning, right? Learning as a cumulative kind of process. How does that play around with this issue of affinity, where arguably accumulation uh, is to be counterweighting the, the relationship with affinity, where affinity needs as much shedding as it is as it does accumulation. So, how does affinity and capital uh, kind of even live together in the same room? Does that make sense? Hmm. Well, it, it's interesting. Um, in one of Richard Day's papers, he says that that there's this old saying, you know, I really like you anarchist guys, but how on earth do you organize yourselves? And that's where he talks about the need for this new common sense, that we can't apply old ways of thinking to these new ways of, of proceeding that he suggests. But I, I still think that, that certainly in the pedagogical situation, kids will be accumulating capital. It's just it might be in a less recognisable linear form. It might be more fragmentary and it might sort of accumulate in at moments of need rather than pre-planned pre sequences. So have I answered your question? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thanks so much for your talk. It was um, wonderful to see and I wholeheartedly embrace your politics. Um, I worry though uh, about the extent to which we might be just tearing down the old hegemonic thinking and building a new one. Um, the child playing the Beatles song clearly has been coached it's clearly trying to please its father. Um, mm -hmm. It's learning the, the music that is important to its father. Mm -hmm. And I wonder to what extent we're imposing a sort of ideology of 
of uh, you know musical support to us as parents and grandparents and educators. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, so this question of affinity, whose affinity are we really talking about? Yeah. Well, it's interesting, when I was talking about this um, with Sarah Hennessy, uh, you, people from music education know Sarah, she runs the big international conference, and she said to me, aren't you just replacing one hegemony with another? And it was after that that I found Day's work, and I thought Day's work provides the next strategy of thinking and some guiding principles that might ensure that that doesn't happen. But I think that it, a lot of it must have to do with the point of origin of choice of music. And the, the stuff that we do, the way that we work in schools, is that the kids bring in, or the young people bring in music that they enjoy listening to. And it's very often not what I would choose, and I certainly don't think it's what their parents would choose sometimes. <laughs> but the idea is that, that they're not reproducing. Although, of, of course, parental taste, and one of my graduate students has just done a dissertation on family listening habits, and, and we know that parents do influence certainly very young children's listening. But now with the incredible um, oh, access to music through digital music and the internet, I'm just amazed at the breadth of listening that young people do and the music that they bring in that I've never heard of and that they educate me about. So I, but I think that it's this, this idea, my big worry with any of these new approaches to popular music education is that they will become a method or a system. Because as soon as something becomes systematised, that's when hegemony starts to operate, because that's when power and control get their noses up and sniff the air and say something's happening here, we better get in there and do something about it. And that's why I think it's so important that we have these multiple different approaches to popular music education that don't try to become one universalizing hierarchical form, as Day calls it, but that retain all their splendid difference and separateness, because I think that way we can escape any sort of hammer of hegemony. Yeah. Can I play devil's advocate to that? And Please. It's not without actually believing what I'm about to say. Is that yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, if the students are coming in bringing that music that they have learned from outside of school, might school be the one place where we could introduce them to music that they would not learn uh, out there on the radio? And that's that's one of the common arguments, isn't it? You know, that um, that they're going to learn popular music, popular culture, and isn't the point of education to lead them out and to lead them further? Um, I've, I've got a number of thoughts about that. I mean, I think my first thought is that you've got to have them in the room with you before you can lead them anywhere. And uh, with the rate at which they tend to be walking in the opposite direction in many music programmes, what we're doing now ain't working, so we need to look at it. Um, but my other, that, but that is a rather instrumental approach to the use of popular music. That's the old, we get them in with the candy and then we teach them the good stuff like Mozart and Beethoven and Bach. And I think that um, it depends on what you think the purpose of a music education is. Whether you see it as to transmit a cultural heritage or whether you see it as lighting a spark in a kid for making music for the rest of their lives. But I don't think the two have to be um, mutually exclusive either. I found that when I was working in, in sort of popular music and composition projects with children, that um, once they'd done what they brought and they got thoroughly familiar with it, they became voracious consumers of all, so all sorts of music, which is actually one of the things that Lucy Green's 2001 research, How Popular Musicians Learn, demonstrated her pop musicians listened incredibly broadly and widely. It was the music teachers who listened to a very narrow canon by and large and, and were sort of scared to go outside of that. So I found that, that once you've got them, you can say, you know, listen to this and it's Mozart's 40th symphony and could we do something with this? And, you know, with sampling and sequencing and all sorts of other things they can do, they can do something in, in the current genre, but they can also use it as a compositional idea. And then you get them coming up into you in the hall saying, Miss, that sounds just like the second subject there. And it's something from metal or something, you know. So that I think they're... We really underestimate how inquisitive our students are and how widely they want to listen. And certainly I don't think popular music, music is going to dissuade them from doing that. 
that, and wish, but you wish you hadn't asked that one now, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Liz. Uh, thank you. I really, really enjoyed that particularly discussion with Gordrew. I feel like I've got it now succinctly under control. Um, <laughs> oh, we'll soon do something about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I sort of like to follow up on someone's question here. Um, related to um, you know what you said with Sarah but Hennessy of this is just creating another hegemony and, and your response about day um, being helpful in that regard. And what what I wanted was hoping to hear was in Day's discussion of the logic of affinity, uh, which from my queer perspective is, is enormously important because kinship means nothing. So did he provide any specific examples? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, of uh, the Occupy movement uh, and, and anarchy. And, and Jack Halberstam, in terms of queer theory, talks about anarchy. But, mm -hmm. but this idea of having this, this system alongside the other to render the other, the, the hegemonic one, redundant mm -hmm. seems to me that um, mm -hmm. If it could do that, then it is establishing a hegemonic status itself. So, did he offer a specific, real-world example of how this work has worked or could work? Yeah, well, I, I think he works a lot with media and cultural studies. So, one of the things he he talks about is the new independent media centres that just exist separately from big corporations and franchises, and do not at any point seek to enter. It's interesting because one of the examples he gives of um, a logic of affinity movement gone wrong is Greenpeace. Ah. <laughs> and he says that Greenpeace started off, you know, and for him he thinks doing it just right and then became too big and became a corporation in their own right. Um, but he talks about uh, some of the new media centres. He talks about some of the anti-globalisation movements. He talks about the Seattle protests. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I've seen a later paper from him where he does talk about the Occupy movement, but I can't swear to that. But the, the 2004 paper was followed up by a book in 2005. Um, and he gives a lot more examples in that book. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I always get concerned when somebody is, is theorizing uh, against hegemony when, when they are themselves positioned mm -hmm. hegemon. But it's it's so it's so difficult to be directive, isn't it? Because as soon as you start being directive, you start being hegemonic. So in a way, you, you almost have to use a whole different way of reasoning. Yeah, and it, and it's hard to see from the from the front of the bus. Yeah, you know, the back of the bus. And, yes. And so uh, traditional and 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 uh, post-colonial theory, you know, we're looking mm. from the back of the bus. Yeah, Michael Apple is great in that in his. I think it's actually, there's a 2015 edition of the Journal of Educational Theory that's based around the question of can education change society and he responds to a number of books that, are, that um, have articles from them in this journal and he actually says um, the place to talk about this is not from the balcony, we need to come down from the balcony and get in there and be doing things, taking direct action. Just to, first of all, this is a great, great talk for sure. Um, tying into the response you had about uh, the hegemony, uh, dealing with one of the concerns being that if we adopt one approach and that becomes the approach we are nearby taking on that aspect of it. Um, you know, I, I'm curious about your thoughts about this because, you know, as, as things have changed over the past decade or so, and there, there are definitely groups like Musical Futures, which has such a large reach, or you could go look at you know, um, all these different case studies on individual approaches. I think one of the largest challenges we're facing, though, is um, how do we get educators to think differently, to, to approach this as, as a, you know, a topic where many of them have not done it themselves, mm -hmm. they haven't done it with their own um, classrooms. And, um, you know, for me, one of my concerns is seeing popular music education in the way that I think many of us see jazz education going towards where it becomes you know, very westernized and very far from the way it was brought up. Mm -hmm. So what do you see as some of the potential challenges and possible solutions to that? Um, 
I think, uh, so your first point about educators um, who are frightened to engage in this sort of practice because they've never seen it, or, or why should they engage in it? I think um, my only answer to that is that we need to actually get out there and do it, and do it well. And I think we spend a lot of time talking about doing it, and maybe we could spend more time. <laughs> so I shouldn't be here, should I? <laughs> maybe we should spend more time actually out in classrooms and, and music clusters, music hubs and schools, just showing lots of different ways to work with popular music with children. And I think that the jazz thing is a, a real worry. Um, it seems to be that whenever the academy gets hold of a type of music, it becomes codified and reified, and then it becomes something that it isn't. And that's why I think that it's so important to work with recordings all the time, and not to work out simple versions of tunes or simplified chord structures for kids, or, or break things down into easier education versions. They can manage the real thing. In fact, often they want to do far more complex stuff than I'm hearing. And I think if you keep close to the recording, or even better, a live band who can come into your school, or some great samples that you can use in your music technology um, program, whatever, that's one way to avoid that happening. Um, the thing about systematization, I think it's very diff difficult, and I've seen it happen a lot of times to a lot of really great ideas now, that they become big and then they become a system or a method. And then everything that was really original and edgy about them and close to the authenticity that makes it speak to the young people we're working with gets smoothed over and ironed out. And I think the only way is to stay, stay small, or if you are going to grow bigger, to keep having influxes of new ideas from the people who are actually the producers. That's what I think. Thank you, Ruth. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to articulate this very well because I haven't read them in a while, in a couple of years, but I think the concern that should be a, is the recent iteration of the national, the U.S. national standards and, and how they've looked into the future and decided they can see all musics coming down the path mm -hmm. and that they have mm -hmm. the benchmarks in place mm -hmm. for that. So quite honestly, your worry is neither here nor there because they've already, <laughs> it's already, do not mean it. We know what yeah. it's going to be, yeah, well, we know music us, yeah. 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 Um, Yes, and that, what was I? I don't know if it was a. I don't know if it was a TED talk I was watching. This is the trouble with being on sabbatical. You have far much, far too much time to read and think, and look at TED talks and things. But somebody was talking about about the problems of of being prepared for a future we can't even know, and that's a problem of late modernity, isn't it? With the exponential rate of change, we can't possibly know what's going to happen next. But I do think some of these precepts of days are useful. They're like touchstones that you can keep going back to and you can keep checking yourself against. Maybe. Thank you, Ruth. Brilliant. It, it, the, big, you know, the, the tension is there, though. It's, it's the, uh, every time we begin to systematize, we package. We love our processed sliced cheeses. We like to package things. So do teachers, because it's exactly, safe. Exactly, exactly. Because it's the mayhem and, and you know, learning is chaotic. Life mm. is chaotic. Mm. And that's the beauty of it. Mm. The beauty of it. It's the gray matter that keeps us inquisitive. And here it is. And that's, that's the larger part of that tension of education being a package and being systematized. Mm. So being accountable and management. And, all. Mm. and what, what learning really is. And so mm. I think the words of the decentralization, the, the, the micro, um, the fluidity is, is critical, the, the mm. things that you, that you spoke about. It, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. It's a great challenge. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about this concept of Bildung, which is mm. one of these great European notions. You know, you have Bildung and you have didactique, and Bildung is what we used to call liberal education, <laughs> isn't it? It's education for the soul and the whole person. And Germany, because they didn't do very well in the PISA tests, have completely reformed their education system and now got rid of any traces of Bildung. And it's now a completely teach to the test, get the grades sort of education Not system. Sorry, I'm being depressing. <laughs> People must be hungry, surely. 
All right, well, thank you, Dr. Wright.